On today's episode of Unmute the Voices, I will be joined by Lawrence Brownlee, a celebrated tenor who's had an amazing career in the classical music community. We'll discuss his love for classical music as well as opera, and he'll share some tips on how you can be successful if you decide to have a career in classical music or in whatever you decide you want to do. Join me now on Unmute the Voices. Larry, thank you so much for joining me on Unmute the Voices. How are you doing, man? I'm doing all right. Um, my brother, it's good to see you. Uh, I am dealing with COVID. Well, I'm actually just getting over it. I'm in Zurich, Switzerland right now. And uh, thankfully, I've had the what I understand is the milder version of it. Um, mm-hmm. Just cold-like symptoms and nothing uh, that's been too uh, strenuous or too difficult mm-hmm. to deal with. And so I've just... Uh, quarantined and try to stay away from people, obviously, so I can get better. And I feel like I'm already pretty much uh, uh, returned back to my normal self. So I'm okay. I'm I'm just thankful that you're okay and that your symptoms have been mild. Have you been just kind of relaxing there in your your hotel or your flat or? Yeah, I'm relaxing in the uh, my corporate apartment that I have. Unfortunately, I had to cancel two shows, and so mm. that's not fun. I had a show on this past Tuesday and uh, last night, Thursday. Uh, And, um, you know, as artists, if we don't do the show, we don't get paid. And so I've been here since January 30th. And so that's a long time. The whole rehearsal period, I was fine. Uh, But somehow I managed to catch COVID in the last week or so. And, um, you know, it's not been uh, a cool thing to deal with, you know, having to miss those shows. Uh, especially since you prepare so long and then you want to go ahead and do the shows, not only for the money, but also for the people. And so uh, I've been dealing with that, but I'm thankful to have this job. And hopefully, you know, Sunday when I have my next performance, I will enjoy being on the stage. Yeah, I, you know, that's actually kind of curious because, you know, think of your favorite singers. You know, you go to hear them perform or see them. And then you find out that they've had to cancel or whatever because they've been sick. Has there been any sort of response from your fans there in Zurich who are like, oh, man, I was really looking forward to seeing Lawrence Brownlee and he's sick. You know, are they throwing roses at your, you know, executive apartment or are they bringing you soup or I mean, like what's kind of the response been to that? You know, there are a few people that reached out to me on social media. Social media is a powerful tool. Yeah. And some people on Instagram and Twitter have said, you know, I came specifically to see you in Zurich mm. and uh, unfortunately you're not there. You know, hopefully I'll catch you the next time. But I think uh, for the most part, people know that in these times, even as we're getting going again, that people know that this is a possibility that uh, people may fall victim to COVID. And so uh, right. the people I've been understanding and hopefully I can get to. Uh, a point of feeling better. So there will be a next time and that uh, those people who appreciate my talent can come and enjoy it. And what a talent you are. I mean, you're considered and revered as one of the world's greatest tenors right now. How does that feel knowing that there's so many people who travel like to Zurich to hear you or see you on different, you know, stages all over the world? Like, how does that feel to be regarded as one of the best? <laughs> well, I don't call myself one of the best, but uh, I just call myself me. Um, mm. You know, where I am and where I'm fortunate to be in my career is based upon, you know, a gift that I have from God. But also, I think, uh, I hope good stewardship of that gift and a lot of hours and dedication and commitment to my craft to be the best artist I can be. Um, I don't think that I'm here by happenstance. I feel like that I'm supposed to be here because I should be here. And I hope people understand that that is not arrogance, but that's just confidence. And so when people regard me as, if you want to call it one of the best in the world, I appreciate that. Uh, But I I do say that um, I'm proud of the work that I've done and really trying to 
uh, get to the point of understanding my own talent that I can use it to the to the fullest. Hmm. So when you're out on stage and or getting ready to perform, what goes through the mind of the goat of of being a terror? <laughs> you might not say it, but I'm going to say it for you. I'll 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 be your publicist here for the next 25 <laughs> minutes. But I mean, what goes through your mind? I mean, is it kind of do you have a specific mindset um, before you go out on stage? Do you say a prayer? Do you say a word of affirmation? Like, you know, are you like, I'm going to kill this tonight? Like what <laughs> what goes through your mind when you're getting ready to go out on stage? You know, even if I feel confident, uh, I always say that I'm going to do my best. Uh, I'm one of six kids and, you know, my parents never allowed never allowed us to be too full of ourselves or too high mm. on our own talent uh but to just you know to try to do the best we could and so i've always had that mindset that i go on stage knowing that i can do something and that's being able to reproduce something that i've done in you know earlier performances or in the practice rooms or in this voyage to become you know the singer i am or where i am today so uh, I always just try to take the pressure off of it. Uh, I never get nervous. Uh, mm. Nervous. I have always been the type of person I think nervousness is detrimental to doing your best job. I think people come to the theater to enjoy. And so for me uh, to give them their experience that they're looking for, uh, that I have to be relaxed and pretty sure of what I am, uh, what I'm doing and what I'm meant to do. And so I approach it with a, with a lunchbox mentality. I take... Uh, my gifts to work, knowing that I can produce something. And I just feel confident and assured and at peace with that. And I just do my best. That's how I always approach any performance that I have. And it sounds like it, it in in your um, response that a lot of that work takes place in the practice room. So can you talk to me a little bit about when you're in the practice room? Are you... Um, Practicing kind of the things that you're saying, like, you know, practicing in a way so that you're not nervous or that you're building the confidence. What what is your kind of strategy when you're in the lab, a, a.k.a. the practice room? You know, it's funny because earlier today I um, was teaching uh, some of the students at Juilliard, at the Juilliard School. So I'm a visiting uh, distinguished faculty there and I work uh, I work regularly with the students there and part of you know, my work with them is the same thing that I take into my own practice room. And so I was just not long ago interrogating one of the singers about what they were saying, not just, you know, the translation, but what did something actually mean? What mm. is the intention? Why did this why did this composer place this specifically there? What does you what do you hear in the music that inspires that? Does what you're saying now belong to what you came from or where you're going. There's a lot that you have to do. So the practice room for me is not always just the physical practice room. It's also when I'm sitting on the couch. It's also when I'm on a train and doing some study and some work to try to prepare the character to have better insight to what that character is trying to say and where he's coming from and where he's going. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. The pronunciation and the cadences and, you know, the mastery of some of the different difficult, the difficult lines of the composer. That's what the practice room for me is always in search of how to bring this character in the best way to life. And so I spend a lot of hours inside the physical practice room, not so much as I used to when I was in university, uh, but a lot thought, a lot of thought goes into how I prepare what I'm doing. So it is something that is just not uh, ordinary. You know, ordinary for me isn't uh, something I strive to do. I always try to uh, make whatever I'm doing unique to me as if, as if it was written for me. And mm. so a lot of work and energy and time goes into that. And it's in those moments that I feel like I make the most progress because I'm trying to get the most out of what I can present in any given situation. Wow. So how much of your own personal self goes into the character development of the roles you're playing? For instance, you have COVID right now. When you go back <laughs> out on stage, is there going to be like Larry, you know, who has just gotten over COVID and I'm about to do X, Y, and Z. 
does who is who you are as a person does that contribute to the character development of the roles that you are playing when you are on the stage absolutely that's always been my approach and obviously i'm not a very tall uh black man uh <laughs> and so you know i'm sure i'm not what some of the composers stage directors impresarios people that are involved in casting operas i'm not and so I have to bring the best part of Larry, and that may be the way I walk. That may be my my carriage, my countenance, all the things that are unique to me that I can somehow use to infuse or empower a character. So yes, you're probably going to see a very ex excited Larry get back on stage to do the thing that I love, that I wasn't allowed to do for a couple shows. And so there's going to be some of that there. But you're also going to see the professional Larry that tries to inhabit the character, tries to do something meaningful. So the whole arc of the show and my contribution uh, to it is something that makes sense and it's meaningful to the public that watched that show that night. So we always have to magnify our strengths and our strengths are what make us stand out. So yes, Larry, the best part of Larry will be on that stage singing the role and hopefully that will make it so much more meaningful to whoever, whoever's watching it that evening. So if you met Rossini or Mozart, let's say that you were back in the 18th century or they were reincarnated and, and came to Zurich to hear you perform, what do you think, how would that conversation go? Because you just mentioned a, a moment ago that you may not be what they envisioned that, that they would see as, as the tenor of singing one of their roles, AKA you're black, you're, you know, you're a shorter man. Like, <laughs> how do you think that conversation would go? Well, you know, based upon the fact that many of the roles I have sung of Rossini uh, seem to work well with my voice, I like to think that I would be someone that would be useful uh, to that composer. Hopefully someone uh, that would inspire him to write uh, many of the roles are from, you know, were sung by the first time by specific singers. There's a guy named Giovanni David, who it mm. seems like the makeup of my voice is very similar to his because the roles that he sang seem to work really, really well for my voice. So hopefully Rossini would see, see me and hear me and say, that's the sound, that's the voice that I want to write for, and that it would inspire something else. Perhaps if he had written for me in the in back of the day, he may have written some of the roles differently or, you know, mm. uh, with a different, you know, train of thought because my contribution, hopefully he would see something in my voice that would inspire him to change something. And so uh, mm. I always want to be in service of the music. I always want to be uh, doing something that if the composer came back and was sitting in the audience, he would say, yes, that's what I meant. That's what I intended mm. when I wrote that role. And thank you for being in service to my music. Wow. So if you could collaborate with any composer or performer or singer, classical or not classical, who would it be? I know it's not Yolanda Adams, but never <laughs> mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you're gonna get me in trouble, right? Um, who would it be? Uh, gosh, you gonna get me in trouble. Um, who would it be? Um, you know, uh, two of my favorite singers, uh, ever were Mel Torme and Ella Fitzgerald, uh -huh. and so, um, I really loved them. I loved what they could do with their voices, I loved that they were complete masters of their instruments and knew all the ins and outs of their voices. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I believe that being inspired, you know, listening to them and performing with them would inspire something in me that, uh, you know, perhaps I've never done before. Uh, I hope they would challenge me anytime I have a challenge. I think it's an opportunity to uh, untap potential that's in there. And so I would love to see what that would kind of like spring up in me uh, my abilities and really, you know, provoke me to do things differently than I had done before. And so I, I would have to say those two. Uh, but, um, you know, if, if I could work, you know, personally with one of the composers, obviously having sung much, so much Rossini, I would love to just sit down with him and, 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 and sing for him. And then hopefully him say, I want to write something for you. Hmm. 
Now, you have a church background as well. And for those who don't know, you grew up in the Church of God in Christ or Kojic, mm -hmm. as we like to nickname it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and you guys are known for shouting and, <laughs> and, and giving the Lord a hand of praise, right? <laughs> so do you ever come off stage and you just like, I got to shout a little <laughs> bit because you just killed it? Or are you like, oh, thank you, Jesus? Like, I mean, like, does the does the Kojic part of who Lawrence Brownlee is ever come out um, either on stage or after you get off the stage? Sometimes it does. You know, before I go on, go out on stage, and you said something before, do I say a prayer? I always do. Mm -hmm. And I always say, Lord, thank you for the gift. And even though I'm not singing something that gives glory to your name, let my life, let my performance be the thing that gives you glory and that you would be pleased with that. Uh, and, you know, I can have some spiritual moments on stage where mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, I feel a calm. I feel the peace that I that I think is from above. I can have that on stage as well, too. So uh, my life is a, a, a performer mm -hmm. and, and I feel like I can sense that what I'm doing uh, because I live my life in a certain way. I believe that God is getting the glory out of my life. And so, yeah, I don't come off stage and cut a rug or, you know, <laughs> as we as we call it, get get light feet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, feet, my feet don't get light. I mean, I can get light with some of the best of them. Don't get me wrong. Now. Uh -huh. But uh, I never usually have that moment on stage. But in my personal life, I can feel that I can, you know, go ahead and do a, a a two-step for the Lord every now and again. <laughs> do you ever sing in church? I do. When I go home, mm -hmm. uh, I'm often asked to to sing something. Most recently, I went back home to Ohio, where I'm from, mm -hmm. Youngstown, Ohio, and my aunt passed away. So I sang mm -hmm. at her funeral. Uh, and so thank you. And, uh, you know, it's anytime I go back to church, those are the people who knew me when, who knew me before I did anything. And so they used to call me little Lawrence C., they said, Lawrence, you sing, Lawrence, you sing something for us. And I'm like, oh, Lord. But uh, I know all those people, you know, my immediate family included, my pastor and all the other people from my church. Uh, they care about me so much and they're very proud, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the things I've been fortunate to accomplish. So uh, anytime I can go home and make them happy or sing something for them, I'm, I'm happy to do it. All right. So does the opera Larry come out or is it the Kojic Larry that comes out <laughs> when you get called up to sing an A and B selection? <laughs> you know, they I always try to go back to gospel, but they're like, no, let us hear some of your classical stuff. And I'm like, uh -huh. Puccini in church or Rossini? <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I try to mix it up. Mm -hmm. You know, and whatever is appropriate. If they want to hear something more classical, may ha perhaps mm -hmm. I can offer that. Sometimes I sing a, a Negro spiritual that has mm -hmm. kind of both elements in it. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it just depends. But uh, I do, when I go back, it always happens that someone wants to hear me sing in church. So I'm mm -hmm. usually happy to do it. Hmm. Has there ever been a time when you've performed where things haven't gone well and you're like, oh Lord, what is going on here? Uh, has there ever been a time when that's happened? And if so, how do you respond when there's those moments of uncertainty on stage or things aren't going according to plan? What's your strategy for that? Well, for me, uh, I don't think that there's a perfect performance and there are many things that can go wrong. There are many things that can go wrong that the audience would never know. There are many things that can go wrong that the audience would be very, very clear of. And so for me, I always try not to get, I try not to ever get upset, try not to ever get rattled. And I feel like even if I make a mistake, uh, getting back on that road is just one foot, uh, one step and another step and just kind of staying on the path of repeating something you do good. So if something goes wrong, the next instances doing something right, trying to do something right, trying to do something that makes sense in the character. And so that's what's that's the thing that's helped me throughout my career. Um, you know, again, as I said before, I don't think that there is a perfect performance. And I think it's more about creating special moments. So in the same opera that you can have a mistake or something doesn't go right, your voice doesn't function, you also have the opportunity before that moment or after that moment to create a special moment that can uh completely overshadow the thing that didn't go right. So uh, it's about creating those moments and trying to make sure 
that somebody in that audience can leave with a memorable experience from the evening. And so um, that also comes under the, you know, the idea of being calm, being under control, knowing that I should be there uh, because of, you know, the things that I've prepared and the artists that I've become. And so mm -hmm. I can have confidence in that and not get too carried away, get too carried away by something that didn't go right or something that went wrong. Hmm. You're, I, I, this is just fascinating listening to you. You're an amazing con contributor to classical music and more specifically opera and, and just the art song. What do you think your legacy or what legacy would you like to leave on this earth after you're not singing anymore? You know, I've always said that, um, I've 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 wanted to I've always wanted to be myself. I don't want to be a copy, a carbon copy of anyone. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm always trying to be the best, Larry. So the legacy is that people will feel like he was kind of following his own star, inspired mm -hmm. by many, but did it his own way. Mm -hmm. And I think also a part of legacy building is what you do for others. So I've made myself you know, accessible to many other people, specifically young singers, American singers, African-American singers, which is very, very important to me. And so to be a resource for them, uh, to be a bridge for some of them, uh, to inspire them, uh, to encourage them, to stay on their rear ends sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, I think, you know, anyone's light is more you know, luminous or, you know, it has more power when you affect others. You know, one match that touches another match makes more light. It makes more fire. And then exponentially how you can affect and touch people is what I'm really about. And so uh, it always starts with one gesture, one action, one uh, intention. And then I just continue to do that. But it's, you know, I believe in service. I believe in service to others. I believe in paying it forward. And so that's just a part of who I am. So my legacy, I hope people will remember that. I hope people will remember that uh, I did my best, as I say, you know, when I go on stage uh, every night, but also that I was, you know, available to people to help whoever I could and that my life had some meaning for more people than just myself. Hmm. Beautiful. You've had such this luminous career has there ever been a time in your career or a moment where you were extremely depressed or disappointed or um, had some sort of insurmountable setbacks, or at least it felt like that? Um, and if so, what did you do to kind of pull yourself out of that? And I'm asking for those artists who look up to you and aspire to have the career that you have or have the attain the same success that you have. Um, can you talk about that moment in your career, in your life where it was tough and you might have second guessed yourself? How did you get out of that? Well, to be quite honest, uh, I've never been a person that's dealt with depression. Um, I know depression, uh, not myself, but through people. Um, People very, very close to me, people in my immediate family. I um, actually had a friend of mine who decided he didn't want to be on earth anymore not long ago, maybe five mm. to seven years ago, uh, dealing with depression. And so I know it's very real. Uh, and the impact that had on me, it really shook me. You know, it, uh, it, it, it brought about a real change in me. And I have a great deal of respect for depression. Um, so for me, I've always tried to take a step back from whatever situation and to try to see the whole forest, you know, for the trees in front of me, I tried to see, get a better picture of what it is and to try to make sense of it uh, in a way that's not oversimplified, but not too complicated. Mm -hmm. So I've always told myself that, you know, one, and this is something that I learned when my friend, you know, decided he didn't want to be here anymore, is that I never want to make a permanent decision for a temporary problem. Mm. And any situation that I'm dealing with in that moment is probably going to be more over overwhelming than if I step back, take a breath, take a beat, pause, try to take in all the totality of the situation 
that I can better understand it and then made it, make a better decision. Mm -hmm. And so that's been my approach with my career. When moments haven't been, you know, like I want to, uh, want them to go or things haven't been as I want them, just, just to try to step back and then to, to look at the situation, uh, to be grateful for my family and the blessings and health and, you know, to be, a, to be able to um, put a roof over my wife and my children's heads uh, and to be able to do, to share the gift that I love uh, with people around the world. So that's been my attitude and approach and approach uh, with that, just to try to, in any situation, whether it be negative or whatever, to have the most positive outlook on it. That's the thing that's been helpful for me. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. My last question for you is what sort of advice can you give to a young singer or a even just uh, a singer who's in mid-career right now or just a musician in general um, who is looking to make that next plateau or that next leap forward in their career? What sort of advice can you give them? <laughs> you know, the thing that I that's I give to myself as far as advice, I would give to them as well. And that would be simply never stop learning. Hmm. When I see some of the greatest artists of the last, I don't know, 100 years, I've been fortunate to share the stage with so many of those people. And when I see these people, some of these conductors and singers uh, on the path of wanting to learn, wanting to grow, wanting to improve, something that they've done for 20, maybe, maybe even 30 years, a specific role or a specific work, uh, that they are always still in the search of doing that to the best of their ability and feeling that they haven't fully arrived and they're not an expert, you know, in something. I I love this, the saying that, you know, the more you know, the less you show, hmm. you know, and a lot of people, they will show you everything they have. And that is a clear sign that they probably don't know as much as they think they do. But the people who know when and how to do certain things, uh, I think those are the people who are always growing and learning. And so that's what I want to be, uh, a lifelong learner. And I would encourage any one of my colleagues, people trying to make those next steps, people who are in the beginning of their careers, uh, understanding that we are sponges and we can take in so much information that can be useful for our careers. So be a lifelong learner and, and be the best filter you can. Allow information to go inside without rejecting it. Take what you need, filter out, and let the rest go out. And so that uh, that would be my advice. Wow. That's really great advice. I'm inspired by that. <laughs> be teachable. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Be, be There you go. Be teachable. No matter how high of an arc you think that you have climbed, there's always still more room to grow. Mm -hmm. And amazing. I've seen... I've seen masters actually taking information, people that I consider masters uh, learning from someone that maybe even that they even know uh, in some way, shape or form. But as we get older, we understand that there are people who may have some information behind us for whatever reason um, that can inform what we do. And so, like you said, be teachable, even at, you know, a high position, realizing that you still have something to learn and be open to accepting that. I received that, man. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> man, thank you so much for being yes, on the Voices. I know you're extremely busy, and I'm sending you all my very best wishes, especially regarding your health, and hope that you feel better. And mm -hmm. um, I just appreciate you taking the time. What a great, um, great responses and, and just gems that you and knowledge that you just gave to all of us. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Happy to be with you and, uh, you know, happy to share this time and just tell my story. So. Absolutely. And thank you to all of you for watching this show on Mute the Voices. We really appreciate you tuning in for this episode. And we hope to see you next time. Enjoy your day.